course on workforce planning. This one is course E, a new course, Wrapped Frontline. Uh, session one is the skills. Uh, session two will be on a project to uh, actually get these skills developed uh, in uh, an organization. Um, it's a pretty high level course. We're not going to go into massive detail on all the skills you need, but this course will give you an overview of the skills and behaviors you need for workforce planning if you are a frontline manager. I'm Colin Murray. I run a company called Carados. We're a management training and development company. Um, we work with managers, frontline health and care managers, to help them develop all sorts of different skills. But workforce planning is a core skill that runs through uh, a lot of what um, frontline managers need, including in areas like cost control, even customer service, and some of the general management skills will be covered here in uh, workforce planning. Uh, as a company, we also work with Lancashire and South Cumbria NHS Foundation Trust and Health Education England to provide and support the RAPT tool, which is a free to use online secure workforce modeling tool. Uh, can do two things. Uh, it can uh, store your workforce activity uh, and link the two together. So I've got that repository and it also has a planning tool element to it, which um, allows you to undertake some fairly complex uh, scenario analysis and it's run by those guys there. Uh, I'm the director for the team and between all of us, we take this approach to development, which is so much more important for this course than it is for any even any of the other courses and it's important for them as well we're happy to provide free tools and techniques um, so that people have uh, an approach to use and tools to use etc but you need to bring the capacity to deliver this work and you're only going to get the time and the chance to do that in your organization if there is the appropriate support from it and you get that by delivering a project which is not only a reason to learn for you and a chance to practice and something for you to prove success, but it actually justifies the time you take. And learning frontline skills um, in workforce planning does take time, especially if you take the, um, the project approach we talk about. Um, but it's important to make sure that you get the support of your organisation uh, and undertake a real project uh, to make a difference. And we'll talk about that uh, a lot more in um, session two. So this module um, is frontline workforce planning. We've already talked about what workforce planning is. We've talked about how to redesign it. Um, we've certainly talked about how to develop a workforce plan and the features of a workforce hub in various courses, um, uh, A, B, C, and D. This is course E, uh, workforce frontline, uh, where we have two uh, sections. Uh, one is skills, which we'll cover today. Um, and then the other one is a project, uh, a suggested project to develop skills um, which is E2. Here we're going to cover high level the skills on the right hand side. Uh, we'll talk about leadership, diversity and inclusion, capacity and demand, managing to a budget, coaching and mentoring, schedule and rostering, managing time and attendance and we'll talk about uh, some other skills as well at a high level. And we're going to talk about all of these at a high level with a bit of a deeper dive into capacity and demand because a lot of these things you'll want to be developing your own courses on. These are skills and approaches of which there is a lot of um, information already available on the internet and better people than I are consistently and constantly developing these areas. Um, so for example, in the area of leadership, um, uh, I'll talk about some very specific aspects of it, but um, building your leadership skills is uh, better done with uh, experts in each of these individual fields, but um, I'll pick out some key elements from a workforce planning point of view. One of the skills that you need as a frontline manager is the ability to redesign your workforce. And those, well, the information on how to do that is included in the much larger course um, on workforce redesign, which is course B. Um, it's not covered here because it's covered there for a start. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about now is the skills you need for the front line. And that's the very, very short term stuff that you need to do. Um, it's certainly stuff that you're going to do um, mainly on a daily basis, fortnightly basis, possibly up to annual basis. Um, but it's going to be the sort of the, the very short term skills, whereas redesign 
Um, it's slightly further down the spectrum, but if you're a frontline manager, you are going to need to know how to do workforce redesign. Um, and so it's worth looking at that, of course. Right, um, so uh, into uh, wrapped frontline. What is workforce planning? All right, we learned this in course zero, but it's worth reflecting it here today. So we're here to, report, to support the delivery of excellent healthcare and health improvement to the patients of public of England by ensuring that the workforce of today and tomorrow has the right numbers, skills, values and behaviours at the right time and in the right place. And we talked about the fact that that was a very wide ranging definition by Health Education England that covered everything from the very strategic we have to make sure that we uh, hire 10,000 nurses to fill a gap or 20,000 mental health staff all the way down to the front line where you have to make sure that on the day you are matching demand with the right people. And you're only doing that stuff on the right hand side, the strategic stuff, so that the day to day matching of demand and activity to staff every day is done right so workforce planning happens in that entire spectrum and i'm going to talk about the skills you need to manage staff um essentially manage staff versus capacity workforce plan at that front front end talked earlier about the pyramid and how important that is for this project it is absolutely um it is absolutely critical because when we do this um Okay, if you're doing it on your own and developing your own skills, that is fine and absolutely great. But if you're going to do this across a division or you're going to do this across an organisation or across a practice, um, then this is going to take up some time because there's quite a lot of development that needs to happen. And the development of workforce planning skills will help you to reduce cost, to improve patient service and service user service, and to improve staff morale and experience, etc. Improve workforce planning. If you're going to do this across an organisation, then you are going to need to, to uh, have a proper project to do it, and that project is going to have to make a difference. Okay, If you want to try and really develop people in this stuff, you really need a project to make this work. And we'll talk about that in session uh, two in much more detail, but it's worth checking that one out. Right, but this is about the skills, uh, so let's think about the skills. Um, what you've got are a range of skills there. I'm going to go into detail on everything from leadership down to managing time and attendance um, and then we'll talk about giving feedback managing conflict uh, service user engagement permission and building a team in some of the um, in some of the uh, lighter sections at the end as i say i'm not going to go into a vast amount of detail on these probably capacity and demand will be the biggest what i will uh, do is i will um, as we develop these as we do these these courses more regularly I will start to put uh, longer courses up on uh, YouTube. But for the moment, um, as I said, what you want to be thinking of is just understanding why these skills are important, picking up what we talk about here, uh, but then developing your own learning around each of these different areas. It can be done uh, on things like the internet, on things like, I'm sure it's Coursera and the Great Courses Plus, um, and also working with uh, other training organisations like your training hub, uh, if you're in primary care, uh, like Skills for Care, Skills for Health, Health Education England's website, um, uh, the e-learning um, stuff that's out there. There's a lo whole load of uh, sources for this stuff um, that you can build your own courses on. Right, so let's look at each one in a little bit of detail then. So first one you're going to need is leadership. I'm not even sure this is a skill. It might even be a talent. Um, uh, it could be anything really, but the reality is is that this is number one for a reason um, is your ability to lead your team um, is uh, vital importance when it comes to workforce planning it will make a massive difference it's the single biggest thing I always find that makes a difference to retention um, and uh, thus to recruitment uh, in many cases um, it's uh, but also the effectiveness of your staff so sort of the re-energization of your staff will come from good leadership um, and obviously the staff benefits are um, massive uh, in terms of having a good leader I still remember the great leaders that I have worked for of course I remember the bad leaders I've worked for as well there are a few things just to pick out from leadership really um, because as a concept as an area as a skill or whatever it's very large first thing I pick out is care okay 
what we're really talking about here is really just being mindful of the relationships, taking care. Um, basically, it's about talking to people, getting to know them, um, find out what they're interested in, um, find out what they want to be developed in, uh, find out about their circumstances. If you treat your team as individuals and understand what's important to them, etc., um, if you even say thank you uh, regularly when it is deserved, then you will end up with um, a better team just as a result of that than somebody that does not uh, does not care. But the key thing here is about being mindful. Um, there is a book that I use, which is uh, John C. Maxwell's Winning with People. Um, there are a whole load of other things that can help you think through your uh, relationships. But I always think about three specific things. One is my team, but also thinking about your service users. It's not easy always to see them as individuals, but certainly um, caring about service users when you are workforce planning and when you are working uh, is a key part of workforce planning. Uh, but also caring for your organisation, okay, which means understanding what the organisation needs in each case. Um, uh, and you could see that as your boss. But essentially those are the three things you need to consider. How do you care for? The second word I've got there is, um, is vision. Now if we go back to the implement um, stage of course B, Workforce Redesign, we learnt about Cotter's approach to uh, implementing change uh, and a vision is absolutely key to that. Um, it's also uh, a key part of leadership. Um, you need to be able to think ahead, think about what things will affect me, think about what will affect the team, the service users and the organisations again um, and then develop a, a vision that will see you through those and communicate that well uh, to the team. Uh, get their feedback and, and adjust that vision um, as required, but have that vision for where the team is going to go. That will make a very large impact on uh, retention, um, uh, as well as um, you know, generally making sure your team are um, happy and bought in with where the team is going. Third one is success. Um, maybe not the right word, but the key bit for me is, uh, certainly if you are successful in a team, then that can, as a leader, then that can really help, um, again, retain staff uh, and attract staff uh, to you as, um, as a leader. Um, so success is important, but it's more than just being successful. It's about when you're not succeeding, picking yourself up immediately from that and going, right, what can I do next? How can I move from where we are now so that we can become successful and to start that again, possibly developing an amendment or a change to your vision and starting again with the same energy that you had before. Um, and then if that doesn't go well, doing the same again, picking it up and moving it on and bringing the team with you where you can. Um, it's one of the toughest things to do uh, in uh, leadership. And sometimes if you just haven't succeeded enough, sometimes you might have to take a break or move elsewhere um, to sort of start that process again. But success is a key part for me um, and that ability to build success. Uh, even when things haven't gone well. And then finally, authenticity. Uh, people talk a lot about work-life balance. Uh, you're at work for a large part of your life. Um, and uh, my belief around leadership is that you should be authentic, be yourself, um, pretty much no matter what that is within reason. Um, there's a lot of talk about gravitas and behaving as a leader and everything else. I think the key bit for me is um, absolutely... Um, be professional, but also uh, be yourself because people do respond well to that within your team. Um, and again, you can make a less stressful work workforce, less stressful work environment uh, where people um, see you're authentic and are able to be authentic themselves uh, again within <laughs> within reason. OK, so leadership's the first one. Uh, I mean, I go back to that thing about care more than anything else. It is absolutely about being mindful about your team. You are accountable for that team. You're leading that team. They will look to you. Um, and so uh, having leadership as a core uh, first skill is important to me. Now, the second skill uh, here, um, again, whether it's a skill or not, or whether it's just a part of what you do, this can be trained. Um, I mean, why it makes a difference, I'll start with at the bottom. Diversity and inclusion is critical for a large number of reasons. I mean, the first reason is that 
it's the right thing to do. Um, is to be uh, fair to everybody is absolutely the right thing to do. Secondly, though, if you're not if you're not building from a diverse group, if you haven't got a diverse group of people, you're not selecting from the entire workforce pool, and therefore you will not have the best workforce that you can have. Um, you'll be restricting the, the the pool you can recruit from. So you do need to be able to make sure that your um, your team is pulling from all the right areas and is not discounting people based on the various elements of the um, uh, Quality Act. So it's important to make sure it's big enough, but it's also important to make sure that you keep people in your team once you've recruited people. So if you're recruiting from a diverse team, if you do not act in a way which um, actively manages the diversity of your team, then you will lose those people quickly. Okay, and even where you've been trained in this thing, that can happen. Okay, we it's it's about making sure your team is diverse as a whole, and that will mean you being trained in specific areas. Uh, there is great bias awareness um, uh, courses, well, courses just uh, materials online uh, to help you understand where you are being biased. Um, all of us have a degree, or most of us have a degree of bias. Um, towards uh, and against certain groups that we won't even be aware of and helping to understand that is a great uh, bit of time you can spend. Um, some of the best training and the most impactful training I have ever had um, was on diversity training and specific um, training for me as an ally, uh, in this particular case as an LGBTQ uh, plus ally. Um, if you can learn about uh, people's perspective and the allied training was for me was um, was delivered by um, uh, you know, individuals with lived experience um, if I can use that phrase at that point um, that was really really helpful and we've had this not just for um, for sexuality but we've also had it for age uh, I've had it for ethnicity and different faiths um, and having specific training about those groups um, can be really really helpful um, helps you to build a diverse team which in turn helps you to make sure that your uh, your whole team is considering things from diverse angles finally um, technical training um, the Equality Act um, is um, an important um, is an important act because it what well, it governs this stuff uh, it is uh, beyond uh, some of the more traditional areas. It covers the whole thing around gender. It covers ethnicity. It covers uh, different faiths. It covers disability. It covers maternity status. There's a whole host of different things that it does cover. And so technical training in diversity and inclusion will be helpful, um, not just to learn about diversity, but it will also uh, help make sure that you don't make mistakes which could um, affect the team. So diversity and inclusion, the second skill, and it's there for a reason because it is damn important that you know about it. And it even comes above capacity and demand, which is one of my, um, I suppose, my favourite skills. Uh, it's probably been the one core skill that's been more used to me than any other when I have been um, uh, when I've been working. And it boils down to uh, a few things, which I'll cover over the next few slides. Um, just overall, in terms of capacity and demand. Your job for short-term workforce planning and your job for any workforce planning, realistically, but certainly in the short term, is to match activity with demand. Um, uh, sorry, activity with capacity. Now, you can also say you're matching demand. We'll talk about the difference between demand and activity as well. Uh, and obviously, by capacity, we are talking about people. What we're actually talking about when it comes to people, uh, the, amount, the activity, the demand, sorry, the, sorry, the uh, capacity that you have is basically the um, people that you've got and the activity is the number of people coming through the door multiplied by the effort required by the role okay so if we look at this from an activity point of view you need to make sure that the people coming through the door multiplied by the amount of time that they take to to um, to serve to address to process uh, to treat should equal the capacity that you have got. Um, the skills that you need um, can be in a few different areas. So one thing can be, you can have the ability to feel, okay? 
to balance those things. And actually, it's quite possible that you already have those skills. It is looking at what's come through the door, thinking, actually, that's more or less than I expected, and I've therefore got to adjust things differently. Okay, It's saying, um, uh, Amina hasn't come in today. Do I need to replace her? It's saying, um, we've had this happen. Do I need to bring uh, phone Jeff and ask him to come in? Uh, because it's important. That sort of feel stuff is important. You can also learn to model capacity and demand um, using Excel or anything else, uh, or learning the wrapped tool, for example, if you need to. Um, we cover that in the modeling section um, of redesign. We cover a lot of stuff around modeling there. Um, and I'll probably do a separate course on that as well. Um, but being able to model it is important. Or you can learn to use a system. So, um, for example, if you work on wards in acute trusts, then uh, you uh, may want to use something like Allocates uh, Safe Care, I think it's called, as a system which helps you to, um, to balance activity and demand by looking at um, how, much, uh, how many people are, uh, are you actually got to treat, um, how many people you've got in beds, and how ill they are, um, allows you to match that to your capacity. So uh, those are some key skills you need. But you also need to be able to understand um, your activity and your demand. Activity and demand are not the same thing. Um, those interesting circles that deliberately do not uh, completely line up uh, are the reason why. So the big circle in this case is people that need help. So that is your demand. Okay, that is overall the people that need help and that is the actual demand for what it is your, for your service. What you have though is a subset of that, which are people that try to access your uh, service. Actually, it's not just a subset, um, because sometimes there might be people that try to access your service that don't actually need help specifically. Um, a fairly small amount, but there is always that uh, possibility. So you have a smaller number of people that actually do try to access your care. They can't be bothered, uh, they can't get in, um, they uh, don't trust you, um, etc. They haven't spotted it maybe even. Um, there's a whole host of different reasons why uh, demand does not actually then try to access your service. And then the people that we see can be smaller than that as well. Um, people might try to access, but they might get turned away. Um, they might try to access and uh, the queue be too big uh, and they walk away at that point. Um, they may try to access and we say, oh, yes, you can't see you for six weeks. Uh, and in six weeks, um, things have moved on for that. Either things have... Uh, Things have worked their way through, uh, or things have got worse, uh, or they've gone somewhere else. Um, uh, they've gone to A&E, for example. Okay, So the people we see will be a subset of the people that try to access, because it's unlikely we will, um, we will, uh, or, or there'll be a uh, subset of the people that need help. We're unlikely to be going out finding people that don't need help. So there's a difference between um, capacity and demand. Now, demand... I mean, the difficulty here is that basically your job will be largely to deal with the people that come through the door. So quite often your job will be to deal with the activity, which is the, the people that we see. Your job will be um, to uh, make sure that you're, uh, you don't end up with a backlog on the people that, we, that, we, uh, that, are, coming through, that are really trying to get through the door, that are most urgent to get through the door. But the reality is, in order to deliver things um, properly, is you really need to understand uh, demand. Uh, and that means uh, learning about population health management and other um, systems that are available to help you consider the demand for your service as a whole. Um, but the reality is that as a frontline health and care manager, um, we normally think about the activity that we're trying to come through rather than really looking at demand. Uh, there are exceptions to this. So um, certainly uh, general practice is moving much more towards thinking about demand uh, and what's needed rather than those people that consistently present themselves. But it's not true everywhere. But it's worth thinking about. I'll talk about backlogs in a minute. Um, but if you, um, if you have people that are trying to access and they can't get in, but they're still trying to get in, they will get into a queue of some kind. In A&E, that queue will be obvious, they'll be sitting in the waiting room. Okay. In um, 
an acute setting, for example, they may be on an actual waiting list. Okay, those backlogs are um, two things. First of all, they are they represent waste. If you've got lots of people sat in an A and E waiting room, they will consist constantly get up um, and go. You know, should I be seen yet? They'll take up staff time, reception staff time, nurse time, or whatever. Uh, they may deteriorate in that um, queue um, and cause um, uh, cause uh, more effort. Uh, than they would have done if they'd been seen immediately. So backlogs in themselves represent a waste for your team and obviously a waste for your uh, service users. Backlogs also uh, uh, backlogs are also self-fulfilling. Um, so you end up with, uh, if you have backlogs, backlogs become something acceptable. So trying to avoid backlogs at all, um, or certainly above a certain level, uh, because there's always a level of backlog, um, you're not going to have somebody coming into A&E and suddenly be immediately treated um, uh, or appearing uh, at a front door to say I've got a, um, uh, a condition and immediately being treated for that condition. There's normally a degree of waiting um, is acceptable, but you set that level of acceptable backlog. Um, and if you go beyond that, then that starts to become acceptable. And so suddenly um, six month, 12 month waiting lists are acceptable. Um, suddenly um, 8 hour, 10 hour, 12 hour waits are acceptable. The trick is to avoid those at all where possible um, and then talk about how to deal with those. So we'll talk about how to deal with backlogs in a second. But backlogs in themselves are something which um, are worth understanding and again being mindful of. So from a capacity and demand point of view, obviously a capacity point of view, you can change your capacity. You can bring people in, you can bring in bank and agency, um, etc. Um, we'll talk about budgets in a minute, which will be a, um, a, a, a may actually prevent some of that stuff. But you need to think about demand as well. So capacity and demand are two sides of uh, an equation, um, and uh, making sure you've got enough capacity is um, is part of that. At the moment, though, the reality is it's all about demand. Uh, financial considerations provide a block to infinite demand but so does the availability of staff just in general we just don't have a lot of people available um, and demand even if those people were available generally is coming in in waves it can be a, a tsunami in some cases of demand um, and you can't always uh, meet everything that comes through the door so you as a manager uh, need to have um, an ability to manage that demand both proactively and reactively. So how can you manage demand? Well, if you've spotted that you have a large ongoing demand in general, um, large going activity in general, thinking about how you can move people towards self-assessment and self-treatment um, is, um, is, I suppose, is the first step and is a great proactive step where you can done this with general practice before with mental health services is that certain parts of the um, certain demographics are able to uh, certain people are able to self-assess certain people are able to self-treat um, a lot of work in general practice about helping people to gain control of their own um, uh, issues rather than you remaining in control of their issues um, but provide finding ways for people to self-assess and self-treat is a great way to reduce uh, demand into your um, into your team. Secondly, you can monitor and address um, two things. One is wrong patients. So if you're consistently getting patients that are coming in, which are wrong, they should not be coming into your service for whatever reason, um, then you can um, find mechanisms, can mechanism to understand, uh, to monitor those levels, to, to, to record and monitor and see that those are coming in and then address why they are coming in. Um, there are systems that can help you do this in A&E, for example. Um, but the, the trick is to record those and then think about um, in your teams, how can you address um, those patients that are coming through? The same is true of upstream service issues. If, if patients are coming in and they're not of the appropriate, uh, their weight's not under control if needed or, or the appropriate weight if, if that's important, um, if um, forms are being provided without the right information and that's increasing your demand because it's increasing the amount of time you've got to take those are things you need to log and those are things you need to raise and those are things you need to deal with um, you can do that by recording the cost of those um, by going back 
by forming good relationships with those teams that are upstream, etc. Um, but by doing this, you will bring your demand uh, down. Now then, if you've done all that stuff um, or you can't do all that stuff just yet because it's quite short term and the problem's just come up, then there are then only really a couple of things you can do. And the first thing you can do is you can reduce the level of service that you're providing to people coming through the door. Now, that's either legitimate or illegitimate. You can legitimately doing it through redesign of what you do and you decide that actually those patients or service users don't need that level of support um, anyway. Um, and therefore, you can legitimately, through some redesign, try and reduce the level of service that you provide, thus reducing the amount of time each person takes. There are times, however, when you have to do it from a risk-based point of view. We all saw during COVID, ICUs having to have fewer people supporting the beds. Um, so you're taking a risk-based reduction. It's not something you'd want to do normally, but given the situation, it's better to do that than to stop treating some people and shut your doors earlier. Okay, so if that means... Um, one nurse to uh, six beds rather than two beds, so be it for that period. Um, and that's a risk-based reduction and being able to make those decisions um, and being able to address that is one thing you can do. Obviously that's massively clinical um, uh, in that particular case uh, and should only be done under those uh, under strict uh, control cir circumstances working with uh, clinical teams, but risk-based reductions of all sorts are a possibility. And then at the end, you might have to stop treating some people. When demand becomes overwhelming, you may need to triage and only treat those that um, you can have the most impact with. Um, and then obviously the final option is to shut the doors and say, I can only treat those people, you have to go elsewhere. Which doesn't sound like a great place to get to, but in reality, we, ha we do ration healthcare in this country at times for various different reasons, doing it uh, in a more mindful way. Um, maybe better than the sort of somewhat unmindful way we can sometimes do this. Um, and there are places that do shut the doors. Um, certainly, uh, A and E shut the doors. Um, and you know, incredibly long waiting lists uh, are to an extent a shutting of the door. Um, in so much as the door remains slightly ajar, and you can see it from a very long way away behind a very long queue of people um, but sometimes that's what it is because at the end of the day workforce planning is matching your capacity to your demand um, and if there is no other way of controlling it you essentially are going to get to the point where you just do not treat some people because you just do not have enough staff to be able to do it safely so capacity and demand is an important set of skills to understand you can also reduce backlogs, okay, having the skills to reduce backlogs and to go through it. Um, you need to see it as a one-off project um, and take the right approach to it, which means mobilizing it properly, working out what the current problem is, working out where you want to get to, modeling that and implementing it um, following the wrapped redesign approach or any uh, standard redesign approach. You, um, you need to define that acceptable backlog. Um, you know, you might not want to get to zero at the end of the... Um, at the end of the week, uh, zero backlog, you might allow some backlog, basically a backlog associated with a normal week's activity, for example. Uh, you might determine that a two week wait is the most appropriate, um, but you need to define what is an acceptable backlog. Um, you obviously need to be able to review the backlog to alter demand. Um, obviously, I've done a number of re clinical reviews with clinicians to look at uh, backlogs to work out are there alternatives that, that, um, that could be uh, to treatment that could be put in place. Um, bring out those that uh, no longer require treatment for whatever reasons, uh, including uh, death in some circumstances. Um, so you can review that backlog. And then when you've done that, you need to put in place supply options, um, waiting list initiatives, um, or uh, additional sessions or whatever else. Uh, obviously, there are dangers to doing that uh, around setting precedents, etc., for, um, for addressing backlogs. But uh, you'll need to put in place supply options. And once you've done that, though, the critical thing is to make sure you have put in place processes to make sure backlogs don't happen again. Um, so that's monitoring um, and then um, making sure that they are raised in team meetings where the backlogs might be um, starting to get close to what's acceptable or whatever uh, or gone over what's acceptable and dealing with those in the short term rather than allowing them to become large scale backlogs. So. Capacity and demand as a set of skills is not one that's easy to find a lot of training on actually, so I will run a probably separate course on capacity and demand at some point. But reducing backlogs is a key part of it. So one of the things we talked about, which can be difficult when it comes to people, 
is that we need to manage to a budget. Now, uh, it's one that can be easily taught, uh, but it is one that has a big impact. A lot of this stuff comes down to skills. Some of it comes down to permission, though, and helping people to understand what they can do. I do a lot of coaching with teams around how to manage to a budget, um, how to challenge budgets, um, etc. Uh, and it's an important set of skills. It forms a large part of what we do from a cost reduction point of view, um, which we'll cover in separate courses. But this one uh, also has an impact on staff because uh, managing to a budget affects the amount of staff you're able to apply and therefore affects your capacity. Um, managing to a you managing to a budget includes a few things it means you need to be able to understand uh, your budget first of all okay so you do need to understand what your budget is um what costs make it up what do you have control over who has control over the rest um what do on costs mean or uplifts mean um and understanding what costs are fixed and what costs are variable um uh, and therefore change with activity um Understanding the budget is a key first step, um, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit later about how you then agree it and then how you can challenge it, but understanding the budget is the first thing. Understanding cost statements as well, so teaching people to understand uh, those statements that come through um, is important. It amazes me how often we get cost statements through that are very difficult to read, nobody really takes the time to read them and does not there understand where their costs are coming through and therefore cannot challenge those costs coming through where they are wrong and make sure they go to the right team so that you don't end up with the blame for overspend. Um, also understanding the service specification and the activity is important. So what have you signed up to deliver? Because it's quite possible that we are delivering um, a different service, possibly more, possibly less, we're probably delivering a different standard of service from the one that's signed up to. And if we're delivering more, we need to understand, is that wanted? Um, should we be doing that? If we're delivering less, um, uh, is that okay? Uh, finding out from uh, the people that are actually commissioning the service, um, is it okay to be doing that? Because you're finding it's okay clinically, so shouldn't they be finding it's okay? So the service specifications are important, but also understanding the activity plan. How much activity were um, uh, were people expecting that we would have to deal with? How much are we actually paid for? And understanding that, again, helps us to understand variances to that when we look at variable costs. So there are three things that you need to understand before you start. The budget, your cost statements, um, your service specification, your activity plan. And helping people to go through that is absolutely um uh, gold dust in terms of uh, understanding budget and making sure you're managing uh, your budget and managing your costs um, and therefore um, uh, optimizing the variance between those two. So those are things that you need to understand but there are also skills that you need or approaches that you need to consider. One is agreeing or challenging the budget. So you need to give people the chance to agree a budget and to challenge the budget. At one point, I tried to get people to actually sign up to budgets because in reality, if somebody isn't signed up to a budget, if they don't accept a budget, then um, how can you hold them to account for that budget? Um, but I've often found that actually that's not really the thing to do because people either just agree to it anyway um, without really understanding it um, or it becomes a big fight to get them to agree to something which they don't feel in control of. But certainly getting to the point and, and helping people to think through why aren't they agreeing a budget uh, is an important thing. So agreeing or challenging the budget is um, as an important thing. Um, it's worth them understanding what costs they can control and what costs they can't control. They do tend to focus a lot on the costs they can't control and complain about central uh, charges, etc. Um, but getting them to focus on their part of the budget is important. We also need to think about making changes because if budgets aren't being met, um, either historically or um, or because there's a cost improvement a CIP that's required, so they've got to reduce their budget by 4% this year, then they need to understand how they can make changes uh, to meet that budget. And those changes will almost certainly involve staffing, almost certainly involve a degree of redesign. Um, 
So how they can make changes is an important thing to, um, to teach people as well and help them think it through and think about where might I be able to spot opportunities to reduce cost. Now one big one here, and the absolute nub of this, is playing with variable costs. Um, and certainly the, the area when it comes to uh, workforce planning is important. Because when you sign up to a budget, you don't sign up to that budget no matter what happens. You sign up to that budget based on normal things act uh, happening with your activity and normal things happening with your capacity. If your entire team were to leave because they won the lottery, that would be a, um, a force majeure, as it were, and you would then therefore need to go, right, my budget now is not going to work for a bit so you need to then come up with and define what your budget will need to be in the short term with loads of short-term uh, support from other areas which would like to be more expensive possibly more expensive roles um, but you need to be able to work out how that is going to change as a result of that i used to worry quite a lot about people about um uh, about uh, lottery syndicate payouts they didn't tend to happen um, but it's always a possibility more likely is that activity will change. So you've been asked to deal with a thousand patients and you're having to deal with 2000 a day. If that happens, then you have got a choice. You can either manage that demand or you can increase your capacity. And if you're increasing your capacity, you need to work out how much your budget is gonna change as a result of that because your capacity will not change without a budget change. So you therefore need to be able to manage that there and it is absolutely vital you're able to do that and track that difference um, and actually consider your uh, almost what I would call a shadow budget by that point um, going up because you need to be able to engage your stakeholders with that uh, finance, uh, your operational bosses, um, even execs uh, when they come and review what's going on to say, look, my budget has gone up by X because my activity has gone up by Y um, and be able to show the link between the two and ask for help in bringing demand down or getting your budget up because uh, you can't uh, take responsibility for everything that happens in a system if you are in one team um, you are going to have to either adjust budget or you're going to uh, adjust capacity or you're going to have to adjust demand so uh, important things there to consider now then coaching and mentoring um, there's a difference between these two things, but as a frontline manager, having the ability to be able to coach and mentor your teams um, is uh, another vital skill in workforce planning because you want to get the best out of your team at all times. There's a difference between mentoring and coaching. Mentoring is about imparting wisdom. Uh, coaching is more about encouraging growth. Mentoring uh, comes from uh, the Greek person mentor um, who is in the Odyssey, if anyone has read that, um, Odysseus um, hires mentor uh, or gets mentor to uh, mentor, luckily, his son Telemachus. Uh, and mentoring is about imparting wisdom, in that particular case, the older man, in that particular case, imparting wisdom in one of the earliest uh, elements of mansplaining, uh, goes off to explain this is what you should do, this is how you can do things better, etc. Um, and mentoring is a key part. If you've got some experience and some wisdom you can impart that but far better um, done uh, either on its own or with mentoring is coaching coaching i won't go into a lot of detail on i think we've mentioned it actually uh, in one of the previous courses it's about encouraging growth okay and coaching is about saying how do you get through these barriers yourself to solve these issues uh, coaching at its heart, it should mean um, at times when you shouldn't even care about whether that person succeeds or not. What's important is that that person learns from the process. And you use the GROW approach, which you can look up on the internet. I use the GROW approach. There are many others, but there's some great coaching uh, skills providers out there. Um, GROW stands for goals, reality, uh, options and will. It sometimes changes, um, but in reality it means setting proper goals. What do you want to do to succeed? from a reality point of view, is working out what's currently going on and what's getting in the way. Options allows you to work out how you're gonna, a few uh, approaches to getting past those. And will is setting action, it's basically setting the will to solve these things, setting actions to actually solve them. 
and then coming back to this as a cycle to make sure that it's been done working with your coach um, etc coaching and mentoring absolutely great skills to have for frontline right here we go we're actually now getting on to some very very specific workforce planning skills you would have expected to see you might not have expected to see any of those others but all of those others are i think more important um, than this one because i've been doing them in order of importance uh, although we're now starting to get into um, various skills now scheduling and rostering it's generally the sort of stuff that's done primarily on a weekly to annual basis um, it's a skill that relies heavily on uh, understanding capacity and demand uh, because you are matching your staffing capacity to the activity or the demand you're going to face you're just doing this on a more um, uh, on a more regular basis or you're doing it to a certain regularity okay rather than it being a general thing that you need to do but you are still doing this um, uh, on uh, uh, an annual basis and you're doing it on um, probably a fortnightly basis or a weekly basis so some of the stuff we talked about under capacity and demand was how do you deal with it in the moment how do you match it at the time uh, this stuff is about how do you do this uh, on a slightly longer term basis fortnightly or whatever into annual uh, annual scheduling is about understanding the patterns of demand across the year okay so it's working out how many people with what skills am I going to need to match the activity I need across the year okay you're thinking about annual leave um, you're thinking about um, uh, you're thinking about your um, when a conference is likely to happen you're thinking about the likelihood of parental leave training events um, etc you're trying to work that through and you should be doing this annually to say right let's plan the year across hopefully doing it with your team uh, in some regards now not everyone is going to tell you exactly when they're going to go on holiday you're not necessarily going to know exactly when the conferences are but trying to work that through and thinking right does my demand change across the year am i quieter in summer am i quieter at christmas yeah probably not um but where are you uh, quietest where are you busiest across the year and therefore um you're trying to work out uh, how that works by getting as much information on the availability of people as you can then you're more able to be able to match these together so a lot of this comes down to care understanding your people and them uh, caring about what you're doing and thinking yeah i'm going to try and match my capacity to your demand boss um, that can be really helpful so you're trying to come up with the information on the availability of people you do need an agreed set of rules to govern when time is taken off though because even with the best teams there will be argument and resentment about who's taking time off when. There are times when leave is more valuable than others. Um, for example, at Christmas or other holidays, uh, it obviously becomes um, it becomes important to people. So you need an agreed set of leave rules. You need to a agreed set of, the, of rules to say, uh, okay, guys, when are we? Um, if somebody um, has Christmas one year or this important time one year. Um, what's the rules for for the next year yeah so one person can't constantly have uh, that time off necessarily so it's worth setting those guidelines in place but it's also the key one is how many people can be off at any one time um, you are not going to be able to manage demand against your capacity if your entire capacity disappears off to a conference um, for a week um, at a certain point but you can plan for that conference and try and manage demand down for that week and up around the weeks if you do know about it in advance um, so information on the availability of people and an agreed set of leave rules are important um, uh, rules become very important when, it, when we get into um, actually into scheduling uh, or into rostering um, later on but having an agreed set of leave rules is important and then uh, you will need to be able to adjust these as you get closer so you might do this annually but you need to be looking at this um, on a regular basis monthly fortnightly even weekly to see how things are changing as you put more in you can do this on an excel spreadsheet if you like just put your um, capacity uh, so your demand likely demand across the top in terms of how many people you're going to need put your staff names down the left hand side um, and then just mark when people are off and when they're not and start monitoring um, how many you're having in but you'll be amazed sounds simple but amazing how many people don't do this okay so there is an annual 
this kind of longer term scheduling across the year type stuff. Right, let's get into the shorter stuff because this is the stuff which um, we might not get. Um, so this is done by week or sometimes fortnightly or even monthly rotors. Uh, nursing is often on fortnightly rotors, for example. Um, there are some very complex rotors I can't even try to test uh, show you because I've never had to manage them, but junior doctor rotors can be very, very complex, as can multidisciplinary theatre teams. So uh, those can be very complicated because of the impact uh, of, um, uh, of others on them and, and relationships between the team. If one's off, the rest of them can't work, for example. That is best done through specific software. Now, I can't teach you specific software because there's so many different types of software. I am familiar with Allocate's system from a few years ago now, but um, there are many others out there. And obviously, training in that particular system um, is going to be absolutely vital. But even if you've got that system, there's a few things you need to take into account because I've seen um, Allocate implemented, but not very well implemented, and therefore... Um, not everybody getting out of it what they want to get out of it, sometimes needing to do a re-implementation. Uh, so there's a few things you need to think about from a uh, short-term planning point of view. Safe staffing levels, sometimes you've got to make sure that you are, um, uh, you are maintaining a certain level of staff. No matter what you think is needed, um, you need to maintain a certain level due to safe staffing. So you need to understand what's your safe staffing levels that you're working within. And linked to that, you need to think about what's your minimum staffing level. So they're slightly different. I used to work in, um, uh, used to build resource models for, for card retailers. Um, sometimes they wouldn't have any people in all day if it was a particularly quiet part of the year, but they couldn't shut in case people wanted to come in for a birthday card. They still need to have at least one person there. If it's a rough area um, or uh, areas where there was a lot of theft or just because of the safety of the staff you might you need, need two in at all times even though you didn't sell a single card okay so no matter what you might need to have one person you might need to have two um, you might need to have more if you've got to cover a large area okay so understanding your minimum staffing levels is an important part of short-term planning um, you need to think about the rules again okay um, the rules that people set for their working patterns can be the single biggest issue you'll have matching staff to demand. When we did a lot of return to work, return to practice type planning uh, with nursing, for example, there were some pretty specific rules that people imposed in terms of wanted to come back. Um, and yeah, that was to solve a problem at that time we needed to get people to come back in. But the more rules that there are in place, the more restrictions people place on when they are willing to work, then the more difficult it is to roster, okay? And automatic rosters will struggle um, with these rules. Um, sometimes rules are in place for legacy reasons. Um, yeah, sometimes people will say, right, it's to, based around school hours and those people, uh, their kids are in their 20s by this point. Um, sometimes they are needed, um, but working with individuals to minimize the amount of rules that are in place working with teams to minimize the amount of rules that are in place um, that people the restrictive rules that people put in place over their working time um, is important um, i've seen some very bad practice in some of these areas where people were planning their rules planning the rules for when they were working based around getting the best agency shifts elsewhere um, uh, yeah it's great for that individual not great for the team so um, you need to think about um, uh, what rules people have in place you also need to think of inefficiency. Um, I'm not one of these people that has a uh, crusade against waste. Uh, waste happens. It's a natural part of life. Um, there are lots of other wastes going on around the place. Um, so don't get too hung up on, um, on waste. You are going to end up with the odd busy rush. Uh, you're going to end up with the odd quiet afternoon. And that is part of the joy of life. So you're not going to match people um, but what you don't want to be doing is deliberately not matching people and creating waste. So the aim of rostering is to minimise the wasted hours. OK, so what we want to be doing is trying to make sure that we have the right people in um, to match the demand. And you want to try and match that demand as much as possible. You also want to avoid lost contracted hours. So if you're if you have a contract to use somebody 75 hours a week, which you often do with nurse rostering, and you can't use them or you don't use them on your roster, you're paying them anyway. Okay, We call those lost hours or unused hours. 
and you need to make sure you're minimizing those um, where possible. Uh, even if you can't minimize them, at least drawing attention to them so that you might get some flexibility out of somebody later on down the line. Um, you want to be making sure that you are um, minimizing those lost contract hours. Um, a few other things to think about. Rotor checks. Um, so if you manage multiple teams, um, then you should be monitoring the, mo the rotor performance in advance. So um, you know, this is about uh, if, you're, if you've got theatre matching, for example, you need to make sure that you've got the capacity is coming in and therefore in advance, it looks like you know, two weeks in advance, we've got most of the list filled. Um, that is important. And then we check at that point to make sure that the rotor we've got on matches that capacity and we can adjust it. Otherwise, if you're nurse rostering, then um, you uh, might get helped by allocates um, uh, approach which allows you to uh, see if you're a um, uh, if you are a matron you can see how rostering is going uh, in each of your um, in each of your wards um, having a rotor check process that allows um, somebody to check to make sure that the rotor in, in a team has been done properly and feeding back and addressing that will be a great part of, uh, of rotary that you want and rostering that you want to be able to do. Um, the other thing is automatic matching. As I say, uh, automatic matching is important. You need to get the rules right. Uh, but also from an automatic matching point of view, you often find that managers are ignoring automatic matching. Why do they ignore it? Well, there's all sorts of different reasons, one of which is because they want their friends to get the best shifts. Um, and there's often bias there, so that can happen. Um, sometimes it's because they just don't trust the automatic matching or it doesn't do it doesn't quite as pretty as they would want it to be. So you do need to make sure that you have um, uh, automatic matching is done properly um, and that needs to be coached through. So people need to understand it and they need to coach it through. I have seen so many examples where people in their own time um, make a, a manual rotor and then uh, force the automatic matching to mix to fit that rotor um, basically by stopping it from being automatic um, it's uh, it's frustrating for that individual a lot of the time actually it's certainly frustrating for the team um, and so working with individuals to get the automatic matching right by sorting out the rules uh, and by allowing it to follow its uh, automatic match is important uh, finally, reasonable shifts. Um, you need to give people reasonable shifts. You, if you have a peak of demand for an hour, you can't expect someone to come in just for that one hour. Okay, so I have seen retailers that have done that in the past. It is not fair. Okay, you need to make sure that you are um, that you are giving people reasonable shifts where um, where they're needed. So. Um, Workforce planning is a balance between staff uh, capacity and it's a balance between that and demand. Um, it's tough to match them, okay? But scheduling and rostering is the skill of trying to do that annually and to do that um, uh, fortnightly or, or weekly to do that. Um, final big skill to play in, I suppose, is the managing of time and attendance. Um, this is an important one, again, from a workforce planning point of view. Uh, sickness, absence um, has an impact on your capacity. Uh, and because it tends to happen short term and people don't tell you about it in advance in lots of cases, it can have quite a big impact because it's uh, either costly to deal with uh, or it means that the rest of the team has to work harder, um, which uh, can have an impact on outcomes for service users. From a short term point of view, um, I always split things into short term absence and long term absence. I see them as different things. OK, um, but. Um, Day to day, people need to arrive um, uh, when needed and they need to stay to the end of their shift unless we don't need them, in which case you, know, you should be allowing people to go home if that is needed and hopefully build up um, some uh, degree of um, uh, flexibility later on. Um, but sickness is an important thing. There's a number of things you need to be aware of. You do need to be uh, aware of your HR systems. You certainly need to be trained in using your HR systems to record time and attendance, to record absence. Um, that's important. Um, you also need to make sure that you are not recoding, but recording and monitoring short-term absence um, as you go through. Um, you need to record this as a team and as individuals so you can see what you've got as a percentage because if you're getting, uh, if you're increasing uh, then you might need to put things in place. Um, you can also do benchmarking 
And I think we used to say we're trying to keep things below 3.5% in acute trusts. Uh, whether that is still possible, I'm not sure. Um, when you are recording sickness, though, the general overall amount is not necessarily the most important thing. Uh, lots of short-term, one-day um, people being off uh, can be more disruptive than somebody being off for a week. Um, so therefore, some trusts use the Bradford factor, um, which is basically calculated... Um, uh, I won't go into exactly how it's calculated. It's very easy to pick this one up on the internet, but basically it does... Um, it's the number of instances... Um, is essentially counted more than the number of days. Okay, I think the number of instances is squared and then multiplied by the number of days absent in a one-year period, and that um, that magnifies the impact of those multiple short absences. So it's worth looking at that um, as a potential way of monitoring uh, sickness because that helps you to identify where the issues are. You need to be able to be taught how to take undertake back-to-work interviews and to, again, be mindful in those back-to-work interviews. They're not just a mechanism. We need to understand, is that person well enough to come back to work? And, and what do we need to support them to keep them in work rather than go off again? Um, you need to be able to flag if they're nearing any thresholds for, for more formal monitoring because um, that might make a difference to some people, um, and it's fair anyway. Um, and you need to discuss if anything needs to change um, uh, and also give them an update on anything that's happened while they've been away so that they are effective when they come back. So uh, being able to do appropriate back-to-work interviews is another key skill. You also need to be able to address concerns. I am not a big fan of heavy stuff when it comes to absence management. Um, yes, it has its place when people are misbehaving and taking the mick, um, but you shouldn't be assuming that people are um, misbehaving. And yeah, if you've got somebody in your team that is misbehaving and does misuse absence and everything else, uh, playing the system or whatever, um, obviously I realise you may have uh, inherited this uh, individual, um, but one would hope you wouldn't recruit an individual like it, and certainly um, you'd hope you'd build a team spirit and you'd care enough about them and they wouldn't behave in that way. But, yeah, I'm sure you get them. I know you get them. Um, but what the best thing, really, is about working out what is triggering short-term illness um obviously short-term illness happens you know flu or whatever it might not be able to deal with it but is there are there certain processes are there certain things in your in your team that's causing high levels of sickness and absence and can you address those for the good of the people that are absent and the people that are that aren't absent so um it's worth it's worth addressing those don't forget you should be expecting uh, a week one to two weeks of absence a year uh can happen uh, anyway um uh, that does vary, um, uh, but obviously in a healthcare environment, um, people do get um, uh, do see a lot of people, and therefore do get lots of coughs and colds, etc. And you don't want them coming in if they've got coughs and colds. Um, so uh, you will get a short-term absence. Uh, Long-term absence is a thing to consider slightly differently. Um, there's a few things that you really ought to be able to do. Um, first of all, going back to budgeting, you should be able to communicate this to your um, your leaders, if you've got somebody off for a long time and say, look, we need to adjust the budget because I've got a long-term sick person, it will not work, but it will make you feel better that you've asked. Um, you need to workforce adjust, so you need to think about the fact, actually, if I've got a nurse endoscopist off long-term, um, that's going to have a big impact on my models. Um, uh, how do I adjust things um, for that individual um, to make sure that um, we can continue to match to uh, activity and demand? You need to develop a plan with that person. As it becomes obvious that this is long-term um, sickness, which you should be able to do within a week or so, um, you need to develop a plan with that person. How are you going to monitor them? How are you going to check in? How are you going to learn about changes? Not just leave them to go off. Okay. In order to match capacity to demand, you want to make sure your capacity comes back um, when it's optimum, and that means not forgetting about them. You need to develop a return plan. Um, what's going to happen? Um, when are they going to return? Um, or likely to return um, to help your your rostering, um, but also uh, you need to be able to adjust things when they come back to make sure that um, uh, that they are um, able to come back and work immediately. Others aren't adversely affected, but also think about again what caused this long term. You know, is there something that caused this? Is it stress that you're putting the team under? Um, is the uh, floor littered with man traps, etc. That uh, uh, we need to deal with etc you need to adjust those circumstances there are some other skills as well that i haven't gone into um i'll briefly mention these because these are things uh policy and process 
skills you need to know all the workforce policies and processes that apply to their teams um, you know getting those wrong can cause problems um, with your teams and therefore people do need to know that um, it often amazes me how hard people find it to give feedback um, but there are some very very specific things that you can train people in in terms of how to give feedback that means saying thank you for stuff that's being done well mindfully giving feedback around uh, development so the whole feedback sandwich stuff um, uh, you know people in senior positions um, should not be generally giving negative feedback immediately to people well below their um, their position um, the impact of that is important so therefore helping people to understand the impact of their feedback um, is critical um, because giving feedback should not be a, a chance to um, uh, whack someone around the head verbally rather than uh, physically it should be about helping them to develop and helping the team develop uh, you should know how to manage conflict um, and how to build a team um, you want a great team uh, this may be actually one of the most important skills uh, to have um, so I've put it quite far down here but it is an important one uh, Patrick Lencioni's The Five Dysfunctions of a Team is a great book on that um, also doing things like Myers-Briggs, doing team events and the like to get people together to think about how they fit within a team can be important. If your team is together for a long time, doing stuff around this can be absolutely um, gold uh, to really help you manage your team as a team. Okay, That will help you get more out of it. It will help reduce, um, uh, it will help reduce uh, absence, it will improve efficiency and it will improve the morale of the team. Uh, teaching people about, about patient and, ser and service user engagement um, is important. So helping people to understand how they can engage patients um, to learn about what's important to them and therefore strip out stuff that isn't important and focus on stuff that is important um, is good. Um, so teaching people um, how to talk to people while they're in waiting rooms um, about their travel amazes me whenever I talk to patients about the travel that they've made to get to places. Sometimes it's extraordinary. Um, you might want to um, teach people how to engage uh, expert um, patients or whatever, some absolute clinical patients, some key patients um, to use as um, uh, to bounce ideas off, etc., to help understand how you can reduce demand, etc. Also, formal patient engagement, the use of surveys and focus groups and patient engagement sessions, these are all skills that are worthwhile. Finally, uh, permission. Um, I've left this one last. It's still very important. Um, I've worked with lots of organisations where we seem to have beaten out the ability of staff to do stuff. Um, and we therefore make them, um, we create a situation where they feel helpless. We've created situations where staff aren't allowed to change light bulbs uh, because it's dangerous or because the light bulb is more expensive. Um, they're not allowed to put a hook up. Um, they've got to call maintenance in to do that, etc. And I'm not saying that people should, you know, with uh, with abandon, just go off and do various different things. Um, but I think help managers to understand that they are there to manage uh, and to feel empowered to make things happen um, without um, without acting in a, in a cavalier fashion. Um, it's an area which um, is about developing that as an individual to think about what they can do rather than what they can't do all the time. Um, is an important part of what I tend to do. Uh, it's an area fraught with danger, um, but you'll often find that the barriers are in people's minds rather than actual real barriers and helping people work through, okay, is this a barrier? What can we do about it? How can we get around it? Um, how can we address these things? Helping them to think through how they can solve issues rather than say, actually, I can't solve it, uh, is an important part of um, management and important part of workforce planning. So I am well aware that I've wandered into the realms of other skills. I've also wandered into the realms of cost control. Um, and that's because, uh, hey, workforce planning is important in lots of areas, but also lots of areas are important to workforce planning. Um, there will be uh, more and more of these courses available on YouTube to cover some of these different areas. Um, but when we get into course two, E2, I'm going to talk about how you will be able to build a project across your organization or might be able to build a project across your organization which will allow you to develop lots of managers lots of frontline people in this skill make this a key part management uh, training and workforce planning a key part of what people do for the benefit of the organization uh, and a way you can go about doing this um, 
uh, and then also get the time to develop these courses yourself within your organization um, so worth looking at course e2 which is a bit of a strange one but worth looking at Thank you for listening. You might want to continue that wrapped frontline course which we talked about or you might want to look at wrapped plan, wrapped redesign or wrapped frontline. These are all great things to look at. Um, but you also might want to register the wrapped tool. You might want to buy the bumper book of health and care workforce planning where all of this is covered. Uh, it should be available in July. Um, you can visit the wrapped website, uh, the Health Education England workforce planning pages and you can visit the Carados website. Um, please email me through that. Um, and I'll answer any questions you have on workforce planning. Thanks for listening, uh, and thanks for your time. Cheers.